are focused around communication, community connection and seeking help. Uh, his ability to engage with individuals, communities and organisations relates to his own lived experience. He shares the poignant story of his own battles with mental health, of hitting rock bottom and the lessons he learnt as he picked himself up and pieced his life back together. Uh, his story is one of resilience, persistence and determination, so very important at this time, at a time when stress, depression and burnout is commonplace. Please welcome Warren, uh, the unbreakable farmer. Thank you. Um, thanks for the invitation to come and talk today. Um, I'm always very uh, interested uh, or always kind of think, why, ha how do I fit into a day like today? And, um, and uh, it's, uh, I've done these um, presentations to a group exactly the same as this across the country, whether it's Western Australia, Kangaroo Island or wherever, and I follow on from some fairly technical stuff. And, and I think where I feel my presentation fits in is that, you know, we, we, we talk about looking after our, our soils, our pastures, our animals and, and so forth, and, and we generally forget to think about ourselves. And, and I think through my story, I'm gonna, I'll share a little bit about my story, but at the end, I'll give you some tools and strategies that you can to use to help to look after um, yourself and the people around you, and I think that's really important. Um, my story is of my lived experience, and, and I don't um, beat around the bush when it comes to that. I, I share the warts and all story, and sometimes that can be confronting. Uh, as I said, I don't shy away from that, because I think it's really important to understand, you know, what can trigger someone to, to uh, I suppose, get into a spiral, in a downward spiral with their mental health. And it can be some little things, can be big things. And one of the things that uh, it's really important to understand is, uh, and it's something, a lesson that I've been, uh, been taught time and time again through my, the work that I do around the country and, and particularly in, in disaster recovery, whether that's bushfire or, um, or floods or cyclones up north or whatever, um, it, it doesn't matter how big or small your challenge is, it's how it affects you and how it affects your wellbeing. And that's a really important point to keep into consideration because you know it doesn't have to be something catastrophic um, to, to trigger you know, a mental health journey. Uh, and so to understand that, I'll share a little bit about my, more about my story and also some tips and strategies. But about seven years ago, I, um, I set out on this journey. And the journey that I started out on was my, me trying to find the purpose, um, my purpose and, and reason um, to live because I'd lost my farm in the millennial drought and it was my everything. And... I did a number of things, um, particularly uh, you know, around agriculture, because I'd been a dairy farmer all my life, um, managed big farms, but try I stepped away for a little while for three years and, and did real estate for three years, trying to break away from that, you know, from you know, relying on being a farmer. And um, the funny thing is, is it was during the drought also, or during a dry period, I was a dairy specialist for a, for a real estate agent in Shepparton, and basically going out to farms, I found myself sitting around tables with, with, um, with clients and ending up not being a real estate agent anymore, but being a, a counsellor, trying to help them navigate their journey that they were on, whether they were winding their farm up or trying to sell it or they were in a really bad position because of the dry conditions. So um, part of that journey of me trying to find my identity found me doing a speaker course. Now, I was never, ever going to be a speaker, um, as, a, as a kid at school, I was the kid that never stood up the front, um, couldn't read out loud, any of those things. Um, so being a speaker wasn't going to be something that I was ever going to be because um, you know, my only foray actually into public speaking was being a footy coach. And uh, you know, I used to, everything that I do, I try and give 110% to, including football. I was a seconds coach. This is AFL, the real type of footy, not what they play up here. Um, 
I said that I said that on a stage in Home Hill just before Christmas. I was sharing a stage with Wally Lewis. I thought he was going to run across and tackle me. So, um, but I used to have the flashest whiteboards or the best magnets, the, you know, all those sorts of things. I had the best, you know, of what I thought were the inspiring three-quarter time speeches. But the thing is, I could be blue in the face delivering those that presentation, and then the players would go out to their positions and do exactly what they wanted to do. They didn't actually listen to a thing that I said. So. Being a speaker, I, I, I ended up doing the, uh, well, thinking about this um, you know, career as a speaker. I thought I'd better do a course, and I was introduced to that, that by uh, an entrepreneur that I'd been talking to for a number of years um, about self-development courses, but I'd never done any of his self-development courses because they required like abseiling off skyscrapers in the middle of Melbourne and I don't need that sort of development. So I never ever did one. But he said, he said something to me when he rang me and said, look, I've, I've started a speaker course, I think you should do it. And I said, mate, you got the wrong bloke because you know I'm good at talking to cows, but I'm not good at talking to people. And he said something to me that intrigued me and he said, you um, have got a story and who are you not to share it? So that really intrigued me. I ended up signing up for the course and did it basically as a self-development course. It wasn't actually, I never ever thought I'd be a speaker. Um, and at that course, uh, my, my uh, mission was born, and that mission in, um, is in three parts. The first part is about creating awareness and education around mental health and wellbeing, particularly in rural communities, because that's where I come from. I come from a town called Kyabram in Northern Victoria. I know the impact that mental illness and suicide has in our community and I know the impact that it has in the communities that I now have the privilege of working in around Australia. So it's really important to create that awareness and education. The second part's probably the most important part of my, of my journey, of my mission, and that's inspiring conversations. I think it's really important to have conversations around mental illness in our community, but it's also important to inspire them. And I believe by sharing my story then gives other people the permission to share theirs. So I feel that's a really important part of my, of my mission. And, and thirdly, it's about empowering people to seek help and seek help in a safe environment that's free from stigma. So if you are struggling in any way, shape or form, you know, you, you can put your hand up and feel safe and comfortable enough to reach out for help. And that's, you know, that's what really drives me. From that speaker course, I actually um, it went for, for, um, for six months. Um, it was three face-to-face -face sessions in that speaker course and the rest was online on a weekly basis. Uh, the first session that we did, we actually had to share our, uh, share our story and I wasn't really expecting that. But I had come up with three words that in my head that were um, the words that I was going to base my story around. That was resilience, persistence and determination. My farming journey, um, you know, navigating my farming journey, the ups and downs, and they were the three key words that kept popping up. And I never ever imagined that, you know, first session of this speaker course that we'd have to share our story. And um, once I got those words in my head, I felt okay. Because one of the things that you need to know about me is that even though I'm standing up here as a mental health advocate, it doesn't mean that I'm immune to mental um, illness. I still struggle with anxiety and, and um, depression on a daily basis. So I've just now got better tools in my toolbox to help me navigate that journey. And um, so that day my anxiety was through the roof and when we got to the, um, to the venue where the course was being held, the facilitator gave us a piece of paper and of course after introductions we all then had to give a seven minute presentation on what our story was going to be and to be honest I was absolutely crapping myself because I had no idea what I was going to share. I got up when it came my turn, um, shared my seven minutes of I don't know what, I just blurted it out um, and it would be made quite difficult, the exercise, because there was two boxes that we had to tick off in this exercise. One, it had to be a heartfelt story. Now, that was going to be easy for me because it was my story, but I was doing the course with a, with a lot of business owners, whether they were accountants or IT experts or, or um, people that had written books and they were just learn, wanting to learn how to articulate their business model better. Um, for me, that, you know, that heartfelt story was going to be hard and I don't need to mean to offend if there is any accountants in the room, but it would be really hard to give a heartfelt story around um, spreadsheets and figures, I, I, I believe, like as a, as a lay person. 
Um, the second box to tick was going to be hard for everybody, um, and particularly for those sort of people like the accountants in the room, because the second box you had to tick was you had to make someone cry. Now, don't get me wrong, I've sat in front of my accountant a number of times and he has made me cry, but it's not from a heartfelt message. It's generally what he pushes across the table to me. So, um, but for me, um, I found that quite challenging. Luckily for me, there was two very emotional ladies doing the course with me. They ended up crying, so I was um, off to a flying start. I ticked both the boxes in that exercise and I thought, this speaking stuff's a lot easier than milk and cows, so maybe there might be something in it. While I was standing up there um, sharing my seven minutes of I don't know what, um, the, the exercise that was after the morning tea break was already rolling around in my head and it was starting to get a little bit woohoo and a bit far-fetched for me because the next exercise or the next part of the workshop was coming up with a superhero name. Now, to be honest with you, my internal dialogue's not really brilliant at, at stages and definitely while I was giving that talk, it wasn't um, overly great. And so while I was standing there doing that presentation, my superhero name was rolling around in my head or what I thought it was going to be. And basically that was Warren the Wanker. It was rolling around in my head over and over and over again because that's what I felt like. And I couldn't think of anything else. But after I gave my talk, I walked off the, or out of the front of the room. We walked straight into the morning tea break. And one of the guys came over to me and said, mate, I know what your superhero name is. You're the unbreakable farmer. And I thought, well, that was a great, sounded like a great name. So I registered that on um, GoDaddy straight away. Um, it was available, the name, um, theunbreakablefarmer.com.au. So I registered it. That's how I become the unbreakable farmer. My story is actually being, is more about being broken and unbreakable. I had to, obviously, but part of that course was to look professional, build a business model. So I got a mate to, to knock up this um, logo for me and it stemmed from a conversation or it started off as a Facebook message that I sent him. I said, mate, I need a logo, I need it quick. I've got a gig on Friday night, this was Wednesday night. And I said, I need a logo. He goes, what do you need a logo? So I, that intrigued him, obviously. He rang me. He said, what do you need a logo for? I said, I need a logo because I've become a professional speaker. Well, he just started laughing because he knew exactly who I was and this was way outside my comfort zone. Well, he even knew that. He said, well, what are you going to talk about? I said, about resilience, persistence, determination, about my farming journey. And he said, well, that's a good thing to do because he knew a lot about my farming journey he knew the struggles that we'd had on the farm, particularly with, um, you know, with, um, with floods and droughts and, and so forth. Um, and he goes, well, that's a good thing to talk about. And I said, actually, I've had a, a couple of speaking gigs now and I'm now sharing a little bit about my mental health journey as well. And that was a real eye-opener to me because there was dead silence on the end of the phone and he goes, after a, a couple of moments of silence, what mental health journey? And I said, oh, my mental health journey. And he goes, well, maybe we'll need to talk about that a bit later on because he had no idea. He's one of my best mates but never understood about my mental health journey. After we got past that fairly, um, you know, awkward situation, the, the next bit was he had to ask what my branding was going to be and obviously he had the same superhero name running around in his head as what I did while I was giving my seven-minute presentation because he thought I was pulling his leg. Um, and then I told him it was the unbreakable farmer. Well, then he went into fits of hysterics because he really thought I was pulling his leg then. He actually hung up and then about a couple of minutes later, he rang up and he goes, look, sorry about that, it's a bit disrespectful, but um, is there anything else I need to know about this logo? And I said, no, um, you've basically got it all. And about 20 minutes later, he sent this logo back to me. Now, if you have a look at the unbreakable word and you have a look next to it, there's two bits of wheat next to it. Kind of missed the scope a little bit because I was a dairy farmer. <laughs> you reckon he could have put some cows on there, couldn't you? And look, I'm, I own my own farm for 19 years and I've managed five big operations, one in South Australia and four in the Goulburn Valley. Not one of them ever had a windmill. <laughs> <laughs> so he had this kind of perception around farming that you've got to stick a windmill there, but you know, it kind of fits the picture. 
But the more and more I stood in front of this logo and looked at it, I look at the farmer, he looks like he's had a tough day or there's lots of stuff going on. He's got lots of things to think about, lots of things to ponder. It's either too wet, too dry. You know, he, he's missed his sewing window. All these things kill. The pump's broken down. Whatever it is, he looks like he's pondering his day and he's had a, you know, he's got a fair bit on his mind. <clears throat> and because he designed the logo as a, as a, um, as a silhouette, he's got his trusty dog standing behind him. But if you have a look at the dog, because it's a silhouette, the dog's black. And everyone knows the black dog is a symbol for mental illness. And that's when I realised, without telling him, because he'd get a big head, that my mate was quite clever. Because in a 15-minute phone call, he deciphered enough information to knock this logo up. And that's how the Unbreakable Farmer was born. My story actually started in Melbourne. <coughs> I was son of small business owners. Dad was a butcher by trade. We used to move around a fair bit. Dad liked dibbling and dabbling in, in things. We had milk bars, butcher shops, um, post offices, etc., etc. And it wasn't at the age of 15, I was really struggling at school. I was actually failing year nine when Dad came to me and said, Look, we're moving, we're going to move to the country, we're going to buy a dairy farm. Now, I was happy with that because. We had friends that were dairy farmers in Gippsland. I had an uncle that was a dairy farmer in northern Victoria. Spent a lot of time on those farms and I loved farming because farming to me was all about tractors, motorbikes and slug guns. That's what I thought farming was and I used to love farming. Um, obviously, as my career developed, a lot more other passions become involved, but, you know, moved to the country. I could get away because at school, at school in Melbourne, I was subjected to a lot of bullying and, and you know, my mental health and education were spiralling out of control. So I thought this is a great opportunity to, to reinvent myself. And we moved to the country, moved to a, a place called Merrigam, just outside of Kyabram. Started school at Kyabram, but at the end of the day, um, <coughs> school wasn't for me. And as I moved into year 10, it wasn't long into that year after failing year nine, but in, they gave me the benefit of the, net, the um, benefit of the doubt. I moved into um, into year ten, but I, and I had to make a decision pretty much in that first term. Or what what are we going to do with you? Because school's not for you. My principal actually suggested that I become a tradie. I um, lost a lot of respect for that guy that day because if he had to come to any of my woodwork or metalwork classes, he would have realised pretty quickly that I was never going to be a tradie. Um, but I chose farming, moving out of that meeting that they had with mum and dad, I told mum I wanted to be a farmer and, and that was the career that I pursued and now I worked for, I got a job with the best dairy farmer in the district, he promised to teach me everything I needed to know, including that first day when I walked down to a paddock in the front of the dairy while I was waiting for him to come back from breakfast and I thought I'd chip some thistles and I um, went back and chipped off my first thistle and sliced through the two-inch water delivery line to the farm. Now, as a kid from Melbourne, I had no idea how to fix that. So as my boss come back from breakfast, he looked out, the ute, out, out his window of his ute and here I was laying on this fountain of water coming out of the ground trying to stop it. I realise now that all I had to do is go into the pump shed and flick a switch, but didn't know that at that stage. But that day I learnt to be a plumber. I learnt to fence and pull tractors apart, grow grass, fix cows, do everything you needed to do um, to be a farmer. So when I got to the age of 22, I decided to go out on my own. And we created a family business with mum and dad. I bought 200 acres next to their farm. And naively as that 22-year-old went into business with mum and dad, and anyone that's been in a family business knows that that can be fraught with danger, went into business with the bank because they lent me the money. I also went into, bank, in, into um, business with my silent business partner and her name was Mother Nature. Now, when I say at the start, it doesn't matter how big or small your challenge is, I feel like a bit of a, an imposter sometimes when I'm sharing my story because here I am sharing a flood story. And that was the first time Mother Nature come, um, come knocking on our door. Now, Last year at a vegetable conference in Brisbane, I was sharing this to 400 people in the room and 100 growers in that room were all from the Lockyer Valley. And I'm talking about my pissy little flood story. Those guys were telling me about being rescued off the roof of their house with a helicopter. I could still walk around my farm, as you could see, but I was underwater for a month, complete, um, full, nearly a complete full month of underwater. 
um, and everyone that knows anything about pasture, which there should be a few in this room, know that if you're underwater for a month, there's not much left when it, when it leaves. And all I had was basically a lunar landscape, very smelly mess. Um, this flood taught me, taught me a, lot of, um, a lot of lessons. It taught me a lot about resilience, about adapting to change, about developing different ways to, um, to get around a problem. Um, but it happened at a really bad time. We were, it was um, 4th of October, our cows were about to hit peak production, had all my hay locked up, we lost everything. So financially it sat us on our backside. But what this did is all that stuff that I intended to leave behind in Melbourne, the stress of this event triggered what I now call my mental health journey. One of the important things to understand, and particularly on, on days like this, and it doesn't matter if you're a farmer or a service provider, is that most plans um, on farms are all about looking after your farm and your pastures, your soils and all that. And one of the things that gets forgotten in most people's plans or planning is looking after yourself. Now, from this flood, I didn't look after myself. I, it was all about recovery. And um, what this flood actually did for me was trigger the stress of it, triggered what I now call my mental health journey. And I never had anything in my plan to navigate that, through that. It was all about recovery, which we recovered and we started moving forward. About two and a half years after that event, we had a family bust up on the farm. Now, that, this was a big challenge for me because family is my number one value. So once we started, Mum and Dad and my relationship started falling apart to a complete relationship breakdown, had a massive impact on me and it turned what I thought, well, that, that start of at the flood, my mental health journey was just a cloud above my head. This triggered it into a spiral and I started spiralling out of control. The thing is, is once again, the only thing that I had in my mind was how do I deal with this situation and that was to buy Mum and Dad out of the farm. Once again, a funny thing is I've said this story as well in a, with a, um, at the back of Chinchilla there in Queensland to a group of cotton growers. And I said, I took on a million dollars worth of debt. They all went, that's all I could hear from the audience. But as I actually looked out of the shed that I was talking in, it looked like Toyota had just done an airdrop of all the brand new land cruisers that had ever hit the country, and they were all down the driveway, so they probably had a million dollars rattling around in their ashtray of those land cruisers. <laughs> but I, for me, a million dollars was a million dollars, and as I said, it doesn't matter how big or small your challenge is, it's how it affects you. Um, buying mum out and dad out of the farm fixed the family relationship, I didn't fix my mental health though and I started spiralling out of control but once again didn't have anything in my plan to navigate that and we did have a plan, no, that 10 year plan we set out on my, my wife and I to pay off our debt, build our business and we were doing a great job, we were kicking goals, we'd bought more land, built a new dairy, built up our herd size and then Mother Nature come again and sent a drought a couple of years down the track. Now, our plan was robust, so two years into this drought, we were still kicking goals. Um, but as the drought moved into the third and the fourth year, this picture was taken in the fourth year, in the middle of July, when we should have had ankle, or, you know, at least calf high grass, I'd hand fed those cows for 12 months to get them to that stage. And then um, they started falling over and so did I. Um, I was at this stage emotionally, financially and physically exhausted. Um, but I tried to keep pushing through, but at the same time I was dealing with this, um, with my mental illness, this spiral that I was in, and I didn't have any tools to grab onto the outside of that spiral and pull myself back up. And what I um, did is I just worked harder. I tried to outsmart Mother Nature and I tried to work harder. I got up earlier every morning, I worked harder and longer and tried to beat what, what was um, coming at me because I never realised that it was Mother Nature. My only thinking in my head at this stage was it was me. I was failing my cows, my farm and my family and I felt a lot of shame and guilt. And all that added together then with sleep deprivation was like going camping and setting a campfire and then pouring a, a, you know, a gallon of petrol on it and it just explodes in your face. And, and that's where I found myself. And I found myself at a rock bottom spot where I believe the world was better off without me. 
and I call this moment in time my two feet of perspective, where life gave me two choices that day. Um, those two choices were either, you know, continue to become bitter and twisted about what was going on, or I could choose to get better. Now, I chose to get better that day, and um, that journey is still continuing today. Well, it's, a, it's an everyday journey where you just try and be a better version of yourself every day. And that's what I chose to do. And as I said, it took a long time because not long after this moment in time, we actually lost our farm. Um, as I said, we were emotionally, financially and physically exhausted. We were going into the fifth year of a drought and things were really falling apart. And we decided, look, we don't want to go, we want to go out on our own terms. And that's what we did. We just locked the farm up. We couldn't sell it. And I moved, we moved to South Australia and I took on a, um, a management job managing a 1,200 cow farm down um, south of Mount Gambia. That was a knee-jerk reaction, wasn't the fixing of the, of the problem, but the day that we left that farm, our farm, and the furniture van went outside the gate, I, um, I shut the gate and symbolically unclipped my identity and I hooked it on the front gate of the farm because that's who I believed I was. Warren the farmer, that's, I'd failed and that was it. Even though... I was, you know, as in the introduction said, I'm a, you know, a husband, a father, you know, a son, a brother, all those things. I'd, my whole identity was tied up on that farm and it's taken a long time to actually recover from that. And that's in a roundabout way how I fell across this um, speaker course because I was on that search for that identity and purpose. Now we talk about resilience and I'm just checking behind me, I always have to do this because one day I was in it was in New South Wales. It was um, near um, north of um, Wentworth, and I was doing a presentation. I started talking about resilience, and I looked at every banner that was behind me, and they all had resilience on them. And I'm thought, oh, better be careful. So there's none here today, so I'm good. Resilience is the the capacity to withstand or recover quickly from difficulties or, or challenges. For me. Resilience is not so much a character trait, it's an action born out of lack of alternatives. As you've heard through my story, we had the drought, family bust up and the flood. Um, basically, I paid no attention to my own mental health and well-being through those and just picked myself up and, and showed the true um, definition of resilience and just picked myself up, dusted myself off and I moved forward. But really what you need to do is... Um, is to stop sometimes and just have a, have a look around you, reassess where you're at and making sure that you're taking care of your mental health. Through my journey as a speaker and through my own journey of putting my pieces back together, I've learnt some stuff and I just want to share that with you to finish off my presentation today and that's one, how can you help people? Because as humans, that's how we're wired. We want to help someone else first before we help ourselves. So how can you help someone else? And look, Mental illness is a very complicated space. So this strategy is not going to work for every one of them, but it's a good starting point. Um, and how you can help someone is by opening up conversations, listening, supporting, and, and, and it's assisting those people to get some help. By opening up those conversations, we need to be empathetic, we need to ask open-ended questions. And what I mean by that is if I went around the room now um, with the roving mic and asked each and every one of you individually, are you okay? And I'm not being disrespectful to any mental health initiative in Australia, but if I asked you, are you okay, what would be the answer? Yeah. Most people will say, yep, yeah, or just nod their head. It's like driving a ute down a dirt road, you go past your neighbour, what's the first thing you do? Just wave. So it's a natural instinct. We just say we're okay even if we're not. So in our toolbox, we need to have some open-ended questions that are going to lead to more conversation. We need to give those people our undivided attention. We need to remain non-judgmental. And one of the things that stops these conversations, particularly if you know, know someone that's either a client, a family member, or a community member, that you, know, you notice that they're struggling a little bit, the thing that stops you having those conversations in the first place is you think you have to have the answers and you think you have to have advice. Where generally you just have to sit and listen. 
you know, sit and listen quietly, let them share their story, demonstrate some genuine care. And, and sometimes, even if they're your best friend, you've got to build some rapport with that person so you can keep that, con that conversation going. Once that conversation is going, you need to encourage them to seek help, and whether that's through resources, support networks, professional services, um, or if you think it's a life-threatening situation, the emergency services. But one of the things we've got to remember once we start these conversations is that we need to check in with these people. Make sure, you know, if you've started that conversation that you've checked in with them and make sure, you know, whether they're following through going to the doctors or just checking in to make sure they're okay. Because the one thing that, that helps people the most is know that they've got someone in their corner that they can rely on. But we've also got to look after ourselves, particularly, um, you know, I know myself because after losing my farm, I've been in farm management roles where I've managed farms up to 3,500 cows with 110 staff. You've got to make sure that you're looking after the people around you, but you've also got to look after, the, after yourself. And one of the things that I didn't do well in some of those roles as well was look after myself. So the three A's to looking after yourself, are, number one is awareness. Um, particularly for us blokes in the room, because we're not really good at this, is understanding our emotions. Um, but it, that, that goes for everybody, but particularly the fellas in the room. Understanding your emotions, identify them, have some tools in your toolbox to be able to um, have, a, have some strategies to put in place to control them or help you identify them and understand how they bef um, affect your behaviours. Know what your values are. Your, you know, what you live by. Because I know from personal experience, when you're really under a stressful, in a stress, stressful situation, you can step away from your values. So you really have to have some firm ideas in your head about what your values are. And a lot of these things that I'm, that I'm talking about now, you know, aren't something that we need to implement, you know, when things get tough. They're the things that we need to implement now so we've got that robust toolbox in it, um, you know, that we've got. So if things do turn bad, that we are able to, to draw on some of those tools. We need to check in with ourselves and, and with others. And one of, an exercise that I do, so there's a couple of things that um, you can access my Unbreakable Wheel of Wellbeing on my website. But if you can imagine you've got a wheel and in the middle you've got a centre hub and then you've got your outer rim. And all the spokes of that wheel are represented by your, um, your well-being domain, whether that's physical, social, self, emotional, intellectual, vocational, relationships, finances, they all make your spokes. And you rate yourself one to five on each one of those um, well-being domains, one being terrible, five being excellent. Um, you, get a picture, you get a picture of your, how balanced your wheel is, or also a visualisation of what areas of your life you need to um, actually work on. So if we take, for example, we're all here today, so we'll, we'll mark ourselves as a five socially because we've all, um, we're all here today. So our spoke would go from the, from the hub to the rim. But financially, we might be struggling a, bit, a, bit, a little bit and we might only be a three, so our spoke will only go halfway to the rim. And I've got it written out on a piece of paper, on a, form that you can do this exercise. I do it fortnightly, it changes every fortnight, but just gives me that visualisation of what, how balanced my wheel is, because once you've completed that exercise, you have a look at your wheel and you see how balanced it is. Now I'm a realist, everyone's not going to have a perfectly balanced wheel, but we, if we can keep it as balanced as we can, um, that's great. This exercise is not my own work, you can Google anything about wellbeing domains, but it become really important to me because I did a talk to the, at the Raman Centre in Melbourne to a group of prisoners. And at the end of the presentation, this guy who'd been inside for 20 years come up to me. Now, for 20 years, this guy had stood in front of a mirror and pumped iron because his arms were the biggest things I've ever seen on a bloke. And he had them folded and he'd been death staring me all the way through my presentation. And he come up and he rested his elbows on my chest really close and I had these two puny little warders standing on the side of me and they wouldn't have been able to punch their way out of a paper bag, those guys, and they were meant to be protecting me. Anyway, he said to me with his head tilted with his glazy look on his eye, he goes, that unbreakable wheel of wellbeing you were talking about, he said, intellectually, I'm a five. 
I said, mate, you're a whatever you want to be. I'm not going to argue with you. <laughs> and he said, physically, I'm also a five. And I said, oh, dear, Freddie, have a look at your arms. But he said, emotionally and socially, he said, I'm not even a one. And he said, actually, when I visualise my wheel, it's a triangle and I'm stuck. He said, I've got four and a half months until I get out of this joint. And by you sharing that simple strategy with me, all I now visualise is I get to that front door in four and a half months and I'm able to roll out the door. And he said, the way I'm going to do that is I'm making you a promise tonight. I'm going to put the weights down and I'm going to work on my other domains to try and balance my wheel. So when I do get to that door, I roll out the door and I don't come back. And that's when it would become really important to me, this exercise. And then thinking about the wheel, it's something that we can all relate to. So um, if, you, if you want to get that, you can download it on my website. Um, but yeah, understanding that that's a really powerful exercise, a very simple exercise, but very powerful. The second A is acknowledgement. The second thing I want you to really take away or understand today is who's in your support network? Who are your five people? And it doesn't matter if it's one or it's 20, but identify or acknowledge who those people are and have a conversation with them about, um, you know, developing a support network and know who those five people are. Um, for me, um, I'm lucky I've got five kids. I've got a wife, a doctor and a psychologist. Um, the thing that's very in interesting out of doing this exercise for me, my two best mates aren't in my support network. They're not part of it because they don't have the tools in, my tool in their toolbox to be able to support me if things really fall apart. And the other interesting thing is, is my two dogs play the biggest part of my support network. Because we can go for a walk, I'm an irrigation, we live in an irrigation town, we go for a walk along the channel every night. All they want to do is swim. If I've had a bad day, I can tell them what's on my mind. They look back at me, they don't care what I've told them. They don't judge me, they still love me, I feel better. They get a swim, everyone's a winner. So they play a big part in my support network. So try and identify who those five people in your life are. Know your triggers, your positive, your negative, um, triggers your stresses and your challenges and have a non-negotiable in your day that you can use every day just for yourself. It's not for work, it's not for your family, it's not for your community, it's just for you. Something simple that you do on a daily basis um, just to give yourself 10 minutes of you time, um, whether it's reading a book, listening to a song, going for a walk, whatever that is. Third, um, third A is action. Control what you've got control over. For me, um, through my story, um, I, if you can't, and the way I look at it, if you can control it and, and you've got power to control it, that's great. If you, can, if, you need, if you can't control it and you need to, that's when you stick your hand up and ask for help. And, and that goes for anything. We can be talking about anything, like anything in business, in relationships. Um, you know, if you need help, stick your hand up and ask for it. There's people out there that are there to support you. Um, have some gratitude, your who, what and your why, and have them, some mindfulness strategies in your toolbox as well. For me, it's a rem my mindfulness strategy is a remnant of being a dairy farmer. I take sunrise and sunset photos and just on my phone for no one to look at, but it just gives me the ability to step outside my busy head and focus on something that's bigger um, and more powerful than me. And that's not religious or spiritual, that's just, you know, it's, it's something that's bigger than me. Um, gives me that opportunity to focus on those small things. Um, and just remember, control what you've got control over. To leave you with my three lessons, my three greatest failures. Um, number one, communication's key. We need to talk about this stuff, um, whether it's on a personal basis with the people that we work with, with our clients, we need to talk um, about this stuff and be more open. Um, don't be frightened to have that conversation. A lot of mental health strategies are around people reaching out for help, but it's just as important and just as hard and it requires just as much courage some, to reach in and ask someone if they're doing, you know, are they okay and can you support them? So communication is so important. Um, why it's my number one lesson? When I show true resilience that day when that two feet of um, perspective day, when I picked myself up, I showed true resilience, dusted myself off and I went home. And I didn't actually discuss what happened that afternoon with my wife for three and a half years. 
Um, that was a massive burden to carry and it wasn't until I gained the courage to talk to her and others about um, what happened that afternoon is that's when my recovery actually started. Uh, we need to stay connected. Stay connected to our community, whatever that looks like, um, whether your community is family, whether it's friends, whether it's your sporting club, whether it's an industry group or, or whoever, whether it's work colleagues, we need to stay connected because isolation is the biggest killer in our community. And there's also another powerful thing in every community and that's shared wisdom. And days like today are where wisdom is shared. And, but one of the things we do with a lot of wisdom, um, you know, we're all travelling a journey where we've, we've picked wisdom up along the way, is that we hold it close to our chest and we don't share it. And it's really important that we share that wisdom because that wisdom that you're holding on to could be the wisdom that the person sitting next to you has been searching for all their life. So make sure, um, stay connected and share your wisdom within your community and making sure that we're communicating with people. And then thirdly, it's about seeking help. Make sure you're reaching out. If you are struggling, make sure you reach out and get some support. But if you know someone who is struggling, reach in and support them. It's really important. Um, I've got a podcast that you can listen to. There's some really great stories of people that I've, I've, I've met along the way um, that share their mental health journeys or some of their tips and strategies that they use. Also a newsletter that you can subscribe to as well. But you can find all that on my website. Um, but what, I, what makes me truly grateful is if a group of people want to listen to a washed up dairy farmer speak for a little while, that makes me truly grateful talk about gratitude a fair bit in a lot of my presentations. But what would make me truly grateful is if you've heard something today that's either made you think or that you can use to either help yourself or help someone that you love, that's what would make me truly grateful. So thanks for having me. Thanks for giving me the opportunity to present this afternoon. And um, yeah, cheers. Thanks for coming along. Yeah, thanks, Warren, and yeah, that was a great, great talk, and I'm sure lots of people in the room here have taken a fair bit out of that.